Okay, first, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak, and I'm, I'm really very happy to speak uh, at the conference in honor of, of the Ma. Um, uh, we started about the same time. I mean, he, he started a bit earlier, um, and I, I'm really happy actually that he's part of the, of the geometric group community, uh, geometric group theory community, if he's still part of it. Uh, and yeah, I think one of the great things. Um, that are still true for academia is to have uh, people like him around. Um, unfortunately, now it's, it's it's quite a big distance, but uh, and, and much less conferences in person. But but still, um, it's it's a great advantage. Okay, um, what, what I uh, decided to talk about actually, I, I myself now um, in recent years work less on, on groups, but. Um, but I choose um, I choose this topic, which um, it actually emerged from a question that um, that Ilya Rips asked me exactly a year ago, and somehow completely uh, uh, took me out of what what I'm doing. I mean, this question, and this this was an attempt to answer what he asked. I'll get to that. Um, so so I actually I, I worked on the JSJ st starting at the IHS uh, more or less 30 years ago uh, in 1991. Um, I will, I will, uh, okay, I will say something about how it started. And, um, you know, for me, I, I looked mainly for applications or for, um, for appearances of the JSJ in other algebraic categories. Um, but uh, apparently there are uh, new things that, um, that uh, are related to the JSJ, or anyway, some extensions of the JSJ uh, in groups. That I, I was rather surprised by that. Um, and I should say also that, um, you know, when I was, um, you know, 30 years ago, okay, when, I, when I started my career, basically, uh, I, I was very fascinated by the fact that, that um, theories from, from three-dimensional topology, um, not only that they can be transferred to groups, but they are crucial uh, to, to groups in order to prove all sorts of things. Now, I think the JSJ is also fundamental in logic. Um, and by moving to other categories, I thought that, um, you know, it's about time. First of all, I found out that JSJ is, is, uh, is probably fundamental in other algebraic categories, such as people didn't know about this. Um, and, uh, you know, one, one of the reasons to, to go to other categories is to try eventually to, to find some sort of categorical formulation of the JSJ, because I think it's, it's that general. But on the other hand, what happened is that whenever I go to another algebraic category, the, Really, lots of new phenomena, and now also in groups. So, uh, so it's very difficult to to make uh, such a theory categorical. If um, you know, whenever you go to any direction, you find some some new phenomena that uh, were not familiar, didn't appear before. Um, I should say also, to just a cautious thing. Um, I, I planned to write this paper before before the conference, but uh, but I didn't manage to. Uh, so, so I really consider this still as a work in progress. Uh, it's not complete and it's not easy. So, okay, so take it with this. Uh, I even I even mentioned at some point what part I didn't write. Um, but but I think the work in at all in general is, is conceptual. So so I decided to speak about it. Um, it's also uh, as as you'll see. Well, hopefully, the must still remembered. I mean, uh, we had a conversation maybe 25 years ago, um, on things that are related to, to what I'm going to talk about, related at least in terms of the subject, maybe I'll mention that, um, and uh, it's, it seemed uh, appropriate, but, but it's still uh, still not completely written, so I cannot really uh, regard it as a, as a complete work, but, uh, but anyway, it suggests uh, some new directions. Okay. So um, I'll start with the JSJ decomposition. Okay, it will be a review. I think many of you probably know it, but it's important also for the continuation. So, so I'll um, also to put it in context, so I'll, I'll mention that. Um, so, so there is a now, I think, well-known theorem of Frédéric Poulin from, I think from 89, maybe, maybe 88. Okay, I'm not sure about the years that I have written here. So it doesn't matter if it's plus minus few years. Um, Okay, so uh, so what what Polak proved is that uh, if the outer automorphism group of a hyperbolic group is finite, is infinite, sorry, then uh, the group acts on a real tree with, uh, with with virtually a billion uh, stabilizers of segments. Um, or in fact, okay, yeah, virtually a billion is fine. Um, 
Okay, which in this case means either virtually cyclic or, or finite. Um, and then there's a fundamental work by Rips and uh, by Vestina and Fein, who proved that, um, okay, if, if, if you want it, it's a core, well, it's a core of their work and the theorem of, of Pula, that uh, if, if the outer automorphism group is infinite, then uh, gamma acts on a simplicial tree with, uh, with the virtually abelian uh, edge stabilizer. Okay, so this is uh, this is um, this is a fundamental fact, and some at the, at the same time I was working on the on the isomorphism problem for hyperbolic groups, and uh, during my thesis I, I I managed to prove the isomorphism problem in the torsion-free case uh, when when the group is rigid, so when the outer automorphism group of the of the hyperbolic group is finite, or if you want according to these theorems if if it doesn't have now, now it's uh, okay, the group is torsion free, so it doesn't have um, um, uh, cyclic or uh, cyclic splitting, or and, and it's freely decomposable. Um, so for rigid groups, uh, there was a solution, and then I tried to uh, to generalize it. Actually, while being at the IHS, it was my first postdoc position, and uh, I tried all kinds of tricks to um, to get around the the, um, the fact that the outer automorphism group is infinite. See, it, it's pretty clear that that when when uh, when the outer automorphism group is infinite, the group has many symmetries, and this this may be um, an obstacle for solving the isomorphism problem. Indeed, it is a problem, and and I should say also that part of the solution to the to the isomorphism problems in the rigid case was that uh, it's possible to decide if the if the if the group has a splitting or not. This this is an output. This is a uh, corollary of this uh, of this of the algorithm for solving. The the isomorphism uh, problem in the in the rigid case, and as I said, I tried all kinds of tricks to get around the fact that the uh, to, to get around when, when the automorphism group is is infinite, and I couldn't. And then it, it was clear to me that if I want to to, to generalize it, I must find a, a theory um, to that, that will explain what is the structure of the outer automorphism group, and what what, what are all the splittings of of, um, of uh, how to find all the splittings of the group. Uh, actually, historic, I mean, historically, whatever, uh, Bernie Muskett stayed at the IHS at the same time, and uh, it happened that at the same time he, he found a, a proof of the of the Jay Koshelin and Johansen work for, for geometrically finite Kleinian groups, actually a rather difficult proof, and I managed to, to go to his talk, actually, together with, with Leonid Putigailo, and that that actually, um, the, the proof itself has nothing to do with, uh, with, with the JSJ, but um, it's a special case of, of what Jacob Schellen and Johansen did. It's really a rather complicated proof, but but uh, but but this actually uh, dragged me to the to the direction that um, I better find some sort of, of splitting like this for hyperbolic groups, and this will explain the structure of the automorphism group of the outer automorphism group and uh, all the splittings uh, of the group. So really, the, the lecture of, of Muskie somehow without him knowing, and I never discussed it with him, but but uh, this was somehow the trigger. Um, Okay, so um, so um, again, th these are these are some basics about the JSJ, but but this will be important for the continuation. So I, I'm still um, going over that. Um, so gamma will be a, a one-ended group, and um, okay, I'll discuss it in the in the torsion-free case. Actually, for these matters, there's no much difference between the, the torsion-free and the, and the case with torsion. If you consider automorphisms, at least uh, splittings that come from automorphisms. Um, okay, so so just think about the torsion free for that matter. Um, cyclic splittings are divided into three categories. Okay, I'll explain it in a second. Um, there are elliptic elliptic splittings, in which case um, one can find a common refinement for the two splittings. Uh, there's elliptic hyperbolic. It's a dual position between two two of the compositions, uh, but but then. In the torsion-free case, there will be a, a free splitting of the group. So if you assume the, the group is one-ended, then this doesn't appear. And to a certain extent, the most important case is the hyperbolic-hyperbolic case. Um, so th this is when splittings are somehow not compatible. And uh, it turns out that, that in this case, okay, like in the, in the three-dimensional picture, uh, there, is a, there is a quadratically hanging subgroup. Okay, in the, in the case of torsion-free, 
here we are in the hyperbolic case, there will be some, some fundamental group of a punctured surface inside, unless the group is a surface group itself. And, um, and then the two splittings come from intersecting simple flow curves on, the, on, the, on this surface. And actually, this, these two simple closed curves must fill the surface. Okay, so this is the this, these are these are the, the three sort of uh, trichotomy of, of the compositions that will play a role also in, in the future. But but it's also it will be important for me afterwards to, to explain why the machine that constructed JSJ will fail in the in the place that in the in the situation that I'm going to discuss. Okay. So th this is just the, the picture of what I what I just uh, wrote in words. So we have two splittings, and we say that they are elliptic elliptic if the edge group. Okay, I'm just discuss discussing in the torsion free case. Later on, I'm not going to assume that anymore. But but uh, it doesn't really. It's not it's not much difference. So um, so we say that it's elliptic elliptic if the edge group, say z1 here, can be conjugated into one of the vertex group in the other. And okay, it's a dual position. So Z2 is also uh, can be conjugated to the vertex group of the of the first one. And in this case, it's possible to find common refinement for both. So we look at what splittings this vertex group inherit from the from the from the other splitting. In the case of hyperbolic hyperbolic, okay, so a priori we just know that uh, these two splittings are splittings of an abstract group or hyperbolic group later, finitely presented group. But in the beginning, it was just for hyperbolic groups. And uh, in this case, the way I approached it uh, is by building a machine. So each, each, um, with each splitting, we can associate a cyclic group of automorphisms, then twist, so conjugating one of the vertices. This is amalgamated product. Uh, the HNN has a, has a similar, um, similar group of automorphisms. So we conjugate one of the vertices group and leave the other one fixed. And we look at, um, at, uh, at the sequence of automorphism that is obtained by h time finite, but it's growing and growing to the left. Um, we, we take um, a, an automorphism from the first side, from the first side group of automorphism, then automorphism from the second, etc., with powers which are growing fast. So n1 will be much bigger than m1, m2 will be much bigger than n1, and so on, that, to satisfy certain combinatorial properties that I'm not going to get into. And uh, Okay, using this this machine and uh, and the refinement, it's possible to find uh, the composition which will be canonical. Actually, in the case of hyperbolic group, it, it will be invariant under automorphisms. Uh, there's no problem with that. And um, um, what happened is that I, I wrote maybe that's not a common notation, but but uh, a finite subgroup of the auto automorphism group. This is assuming the group is one-ended now. Um, will have a map onto the um, direct sum. Okay, each each automorphism because it preserves the splitting is up to conjugacy. Um, yeah. it, it acts on each of the surfaces. Okay, so it acts in, as some automorphism, and therefore it's mapped into the automorphism in the uh, into the outer automorphism group, and we get a map from each automor from each automorphism, therefore from the whole from this whole group into the mapping class group of, of these surfaces, and the kernel will be some um, some free. Or yeah. someone asked something. Okay. okay. Um, I should say, actually, in my original paper, I, I assumed that this this uh, this short exact sequence splits. Later, Gilbert Levitt pointed out to me that, that it's not always the case. Okay, I don't hear if someone asked something, but uh, all right, I will continue because it's okay. Um, okay, but this is this is the picture, and and this will be important also for the for the continuation. Okay. Um, this this short exact sequence. Um, um, yeah, is there a question? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm... No, not not from the audience. Not from the audience. Okay. All right. So let's continue. Okay. Uh, there, there was a whole list of continuation. Actually, now it, it's, uh, it's 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 interesting to say somehow sociologically that in the first couple of years. Practically, no one believed that the JFJ actually exists. Uh, um, somehow, it wasn't accepted at all um, until uh, what changed the situation was my work with Brips that generalized this work to finally presented groups. Actually, with, essentially with the same machine, but we just uh, just uh, um, we, we looking at finally presented groups uh, instead of just uh, hyperbolic groups. And here, here there's no torsion-free assumption, but we looked only in cyclic splitting. And shortly after, Bodich uh, constructed the JSJ for hyperbolic groups again with torsion. Um, 
uh, not, not using automorphism, but using um, the topology of the boundary. Okay, later there were, there were other, I wrote some, I mean, there are many papers now that they say, uh, um, yeah, it probably goes in dozens or even hundreds. Um, Dunwoody and Sagiv uh, uh, constructed um, uh, a JSJ for finitely presented groups, but but over more general groups, so say over polycyclic groups. And then Koji Fujiwara and Panos Papazoglu uh, constructed actually it's a slightly more general result, but over the, the same class of groups uh, using complexes of groups. And the last two are two asterisk groups, uh, more recent, um, one by Scott and Swarup somehow. This Swarup was rather, from John to Peter Scott, they were rather bothered by the fact that uh, the JSJ that, uh, that we constructed is not exactly like the, the, like the three-dimensional ones. There are some, some uh, extinctions. So they, they managed to do it, and they also um, constructed um, the composition, which is invariant under automorphism. And the most, um, I don't know, more than anyway, the most recent, um, I think common um, reference for that is the is the work of Gilardel uh, and Levit um, that that, um, that that deals a lot with the with the question also of, of the canonicality of the JSJ. In the case of hyperbolic groups, there's no problem really about canonicality, but but the general finally presented groups uh, there is, and this is sometimes a problem also for in the applications. Okay, um, but but uh, what, what I want to talk about today um, will not be about general finitely presented groups, but um, but one should note, you know, when when I worked on, on the JSJ for for at least for torsion free hyperbolic groups, the JSJ encoded both the automorphisms and the, the cyclic splittings. Okay, at least for one ended groups, but okay, but it, it can be generalized. Um, when you go to general finitely presented groups. The JSJ, in more complicated way, encodes still encodes the splittings. That's how it's constructed. But it doesn't. It cannot anymore encode all automorphisms. I mean, even subgroups of hyperbolic groups, right? Like, um, like the example of, of Noel Brady, and um, you know, all, all kind of examples of finitely presented groups. Say, where, where hyperbolic groups fiber over them, you know, where, where the fiber group is this finitely presented group. Um, it's impossible that the JSJ will encode this, um, the automorphisms of these groups, because if, if it did, then uh, mapping, tower, mapping towers over these groups will not be hyperbolic. Um, but, um, but it does encode the splittings. And the question is, what happened with, with automorphisms in, uh, in other cases? So, so there are classes like hyperbolic groups, like limit groups, where the, sometimes the relatively hyperbolic groups, where um, where the JSJ encode all the automorphisms. But in general, one cannot expect that. And um, apparently, there are some natural questions when um, a generalization of the JSJ is supposed to is supposed to do this work. Okay. So, so uh, in some sense, this work, as I said, is it, really started with the discussion of rips. But, uh, but before that, okay, this is a question that I answered at the time, but, but uh, okay, it didn't, at least for me, it didn't uh, ring any bell. Um, so Ruchani asked me, I think around 2007, it was the time that he, she worked with Karen Bortman on, on automorphisms of right angle outing groups. I'm not sure about the year, but anyway, it was around that. And she asked if the JSJ encode all the automorphisms of, of uh, right angle outing groups. My answer was uh, rather simple that, uh, okay, it will give some of the automorphism, but not all of them. This is, this is a correct answer, but apparently, okay, if, if, one, if one generalizes the JSJ, then, um, then it will encode them all. Um, but anyway, it, 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 it left like this. There's a very, okay, I don't know if I'll manage to speak about right and learning groups in this talk, but, but um, there's a very nice work by Charney and Bortman and part of it with Chris. And also there was another group, um, Duncan, Kazachkov, and Romesnikov on automorphisms of, of frogs, but somehow not from this point of view. I mean, um, so one has to go a little further to, to find really, a, okay, a, a generalized form of JSJ that will encode this, uh, these automorphisms. Um, and, and the question that really um, somehow dragged me into this project um, what uh, was uh, let, let me left my project on Ripsol for now for a year actually. Um, 
um, this was a question of ribs. He just called me one day uh, during this, this pandemic, and he asked, um, what, what can one say about the automorphism of, of cubulated groups? I mean, he asked that because, of course, he was familiar with the, with the application of the JSJ for the automorphisms of hyperbolic groups. And he asked whether, whether one can do something like that uh, for, for cut zero uh, cube complexes. Uh, and, you know, because we know that, uh, that lattices in higher rank uh, semi semi groups don't really have automorphism because of, um, uh, because of super rigidity. So, and, and automorphism say of three manifolds all come from the JSJ. Uh, so, so the question is um, whether all automorphism are somehow low dimensional as, as in the case of, in the sense of the JSJ, so as, as in the case of hyperbolic group. And it, it was clear to me that in order to answer this question, um, at least partially, um, it's better to look at, at cubulated groups, although not all of them satisfy that, but still, Okay, um, it, it's better to look to them as, as uh, hierarchically hyperbolic spaces or the fundamental groups. I look at hierarchically hyperbolic groups, so HHGs. Um, so I don't know if anyone is familiar with it. I'm not going to get into the definition here because it's technical. And, and in some sense, for my work, um, although I meant to answer this question, but, but uh, it's not the, how to say, it's not the main part. Um, um, it's a generalization, but but the generalization, if you make some additional assumption, is not that difficult to uh, to achieve after some preliminary work. So uh, anyway, these spaces were were uh, introduced by Burstock, Hagen, and Sisto. Um, I wrote the, the the this is really the year when, when the paper appeared. They produced it, you know, three years before. Um, and what what they did is they they took um, the very important work of of Major Ninsky. Uh, that, that found hierarchical structure of the of the mapping class group, okay, starting in the, with the curve complex and and using other uh, curve complexes of, of some subsurfaces. Again, I'm not going to talk about this either. And they they axiomatize um, their work and and talked about spaces that uh, that satisfy these properties. And it turns out that many examples uh, satisfy that, and that therefore it's it's very it's very useful to study certain even certain example using these. Uh, Using um, this axiomatization and using some results that they prove for this for these spaces. So okay, so it holds for the mapping class group, but this is the, the place where they started. Uh, it holds, for example, for right angle outing groups. Uh, it holds for um, for special or visually special uh, cut zero cube cubical groups, and they have many more examples. Okay, I'm not, this is not uh, anyway. It's not the main thing of my, my talk. Uh, and, and really the, the main thing to, for me, the main thing to, to actually study uh, and to try to understand is what's, what is the automorphism group of a group that act on a product of hyperbolic spaces. Okay, the JSJ cell already failed. Sorry? Okay. Sometimes there's noise and I don't know if someone asked something. Um, okay, so, so really is, is um, what can one say about the group that acts on on um, on a product like this? Okay, so what is it first? So products of hyperbolic spaces, we, we take um, finitely many, so M uh, hyperbolic spaces. Uh, we, we can assume that they are all not bounded otherwise. The, the bounded ones are not, of course, not interesting. Because otherwise, we will assume that the, the, the action is, um, uh, is proper, properly discontinuous. Um, so, okay, so XJ are actually hyperbolic spaces. There's a group G that act, um, oh, I see that I didn't write here, but, but I meant co-compactly. Um, it doesn't have, here it doesn't have to be isometric action, okay, it can be quasi-isometric. I, I really mean in the sense, you look at, if you look at the axiomatization of this HHGs, uh, but, but in this very special case of a product, somehow this is the, the most important case, um, at least under the assumption that I'm going to make. Um, and, um, okay, what happens in this case, yeah, that, um, see, there are the projection spaces, is the assumption is that, first of all, okay, the group G, uh, it may permute the, the, the projection spaces, so we can, we can pass to a finite index subgroup, if we, if we want to characteristic subgroup, well, it will be important later to move to characteristic subgroup, anyway, it's a finite index, okay, that uh, this finite index subgroup uh, 
doesn't permute these spaces, so it acts as it moves each projection space to itself. And these ones, I, I assume that they are isometric. This is the assumption in the in the HEG case. Um, again, well, one can relax slightly these, these assumptions, but that's not important. Um, and the question is, what can be said about the structure of the outer automorphism of, of, of such a group? And what can one say about the dynamics of individual automorphisms? As I said, okay, I, I thought that I, if I want to have time, I mean, I, I still regard this case as the most important for, for HHGs. And uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll say something about how, 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 it's, how it's generalized. But, but this is anyway, this is the, in a way, this is the main, this is the heart of the problem. Um, now, you may think that, I don't know. okay, someone who, in, in some sense, if, if you looked at, I don't know, pathologies or counterexample in group theory, then, um, you know, product spaces are, are rather problematic, actually not only in group theory, but, but, um, but, uh, but certainly in group theory. But it's interesting to, to note, maybe if I, if I talk about this just conceptually, in logic, somehow product spaces are not a problem. Okay, if you, if you ask questions, first of the question only about elements, if you understand the factors, you understand the product. But, but if you ask questions about subgroups, about automorphism, okay, questions that are not first order, then products are much more complicated than the, than, than the, than the factors. So, okay, here, is, here are some problems that are just good to keep in mind. Um, so uh, actually, there, there are two talks in this conference by PLP yesterday and by Martin Brightson about subdirect products of, of, um, of um, subdirect products of some uh, direct products of free groups, surface groups, etc., or other groups. Um, well, also other groups in, uh, in PRP uh, talk yesterday. Um, but anyway, Mikhailova was at least one of the first ones. Uh, she, she, what she did, see, this group is. Uh, the direct sum of free groups is residually finite. So, so the word problem is solvable. But what she did is she took a finitely presented group that has unsolvable word problem and, and uh, showed how to translate it using fiber product uh, so that there is a finitely generated subgroup of this direct sum which, which does it with, where the membership problem is unsolvable. And uh, since then, there are, I don't know, lots and lots of pathologies that were constructed using fiber products, using other things. Um, Sometimes, sometimes problem to, to even improve um, properties of, of pathologies or counterexamples. So this is this is one one thing that that one should keep in mind. Subgroups, it's impossible to control in, 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 in uh, direct products in general, even if you know everything about the subgroups of uh, of the factors. Okay, another thing that is just good to keep in mind. Uh, what what I'm going to say will not shed any light on this in these things, but still. Um, you know, if, if you consider three-dimensional topology in general, in, in some sense, this was uh, this was one of the direction in three-dimensional topology before Thurston. Um, so any three-dimensional, any compact, uh, three manifolds, let's say closed without boundary, uh, has a Hegel splitting. So it can be uh, made out of two handle bodies when we identify the boundary. And this will be the Van Kampen diagram for this, for this Hegel splitting. Okay. The, this is the fundamental group of the of the Hegel surface. Uh, the free group is the fundamental group of the handle body, and this is the Van Kampen diagram. I'm sorry, I made here a mistake in this notation, but anyway, it's the fundamental group of this of this handle bodies. Uh, and um, the Poincaré conjecture, for instance, uh, asks in, in this in this formulation, this is Stalling's formulation, which is equivalent to the Poincaré conjecture. Ask um, well, if we know that this is an epimorphism. Um, is it true that there is a simple closed curve in the kernel? Okay, this is equivalent to the to the Poincaré conjecture, and it's it's important to know that until now there's uh, there's no algebraic approach that gets anywhere near the, the Poincaré conjecture, although the Poincaré conjecture has okay, a different proof, geometric proof by Perlman, but that's the only proof that we have to this algebraic statement. Um, Okay, and, and one of the reasons that, um, you know, at least from my point of view, that we that this is hard to approach is that we, we work with two factors and we want to make any changes in one factor, it completely, it immediately affects the other factor and controlling both of them, somehow um, um, coordinating between the factors is a very, is a very major problem. Um, and if you think that, you know, um, 
just if you, if you try to apply all sorts of techniques, it's better to remember that uh, if, if you don't look at epimorphism, but just subdirect product, then all three dimensional topology are just in this, in this, uh, in these types of diagrams. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's rather, again, it's, it's rather pathological situation algebraically. Okay, another another example to, to remember is the following. So we take a surface and we take uh, we take a pseudo and also of the surface, and we look at the um, uh, backward and forward iteration of this pseudo and also. And taking the limit, we get actions on two trees which are dual to the stable and unstable foliations uh, on the surface coming from the forward and backward iterations of this of this pseudo and also. So we get an action of the surface on the product of two real trees, and if you look, uh, if you look at the action on the product, the action will be properly discontinuous. I think it's originally due to Thurston, but I'm not sure. Um, so, so you see what it means that if you look at the two-dimensional object, in a sense you don't see the dynamics, but you see the dynamics locally. But you see the dynamics if you look at the projection. If you look at the projection, then you'll see the dynamics of the pseudonus. On each of the of the real trees separately, but if you look at the two-dimensional object, somehow, um, okay, locally we lose the dynamics. We have to go further to see um, what's going on. Okay, so so another example that I want to mention, uh, which I didn't write here, uh, which I'm going to exclude uh, by by assuming by by adding an assumption in a minute, uh, is the is the example of Burger and Moses, okay, Mark Burger and Shachar Moses of a group that uh, act on product of two locally finite trees, and uh, which is simple. Okay, and uh, I'm going to make an assumption that in particular will we'll exclude uh, this example, the last one. Okay, so the assumption that I'm going to make is that, um, you know, when you, go to, when you go to a factor, there may be a kernel to the action. Um, so, okay, I mean, the action, of course, we assume is free on the space, but um, free and properly discontinuous. But when we go to the factors, uh, okay, that it need not be free and it's not properly discontinuous anymore. So we assume that the, the action is weakly as cylindrical now, and this is probably over, overly used terms. Even Thomas has a notion of weakly as cylindrical, but somehow Thomas notion of weakly as cylindrical implies a cylindrical. Um, okay, this is, this is a weaker notion that a cylindrical. And it, it's supposed to, to to make a coarsification of the fact that there is a kernel. And model of the kernel, the action is asymmetrical. So what it means, okay, that if two points, th th that's how to think about it, but if two points are far, are far enough, okay, we fix an epsilon first, and if two points are far enough, uh, there will be boundedly many elements, so that if there is an element H that move both of them, sorry, here I made a mistake, uh, and move both of them more than epsilon, yeah, that's a mistake in the, in the inequality, it's supposed to be bigger than epsilon. Then, okay, it's not true that there will be only boundedly, ma uh, boundedly many elements, but but this element H is belong to boundedly many cosets, and cosets are thoughts of elements that act quasi trivially on the whole space. Okay, that they, they move any point, not more than that. It doesn't have to be the, the I mean uniform constant. It doesn't have to be the delta of hyperbolicity, but but if the Space is not a line. It's not easy to see that it's uh, I don't know two deltas of the of the hyperbolicity. But but that's what uh, okay that that it belongs to to finite, boundedly many cosets. That's what's important. And it, I view that as a classification of uh, of um, of the Slina, Brominger, and Fujiwara condition of WWPD, but in the a cylindrical case. And don't look only on axis, but in general. Okay. So or if you want, it's a classification of of just a cylindrical. Uh, of, of uh, a cylindrical modular kernel. Okay, um, so that's uh, that, that's our assumption on the factors. And by the way, again, I don't know if I managed to get to that. But if I go, to, if I talk about HHEs, then then we also assume somehow there that the, the stabilizer of each projection space there also acts weakly and cylindrically. This is an assumption that uh, okay, I, I have to assume in order for these techniques to work. Okay, so um, so okay, so we ask again, uh, what can be said about the automorphism group of a group that act on um, um, on the product? Okay, we don't care what the group is, but only what the automorphism group is. So we start with the sequence of automorphisms, and we look at 
we look at the action of this of this uh, group eight that, that stabilized setwise each of the projection space. Okay, and we twist it by the automorphism. It's a standard thing. And we, we look at uh, such sequences that converge, I should, I should have written after rescaling, for all, for all the projection space it, it, at once, okay? It, it converges for all of them. Uh, it, it's a, it, if the stretching factor goes to infinity, so it, it's a standard now compactness argument that there will always be a subsequence that will, that will converge. Okay, it will, it will convert to, to, each, to each space. So by, by passing from subsequence to another m times, it will converge to all of them, for all of them. Okay, and uh, the, the limit gives an action on a real tree. And we set, um, um, we set L to be L. Okay, this is also pretty standard now. Mo modulo K infinity, it just, we, we call L a limit group in this setting. It just important me to for me to note that uh, you know, uh, there's a various definition for limit groups. Um, you, you can define it using gromov hausdorff convergence, and you can always also define it using Mars spaces. For limit groups over free groups or over hyperbolic groups, it, it doesn't matter. But here, the definition varies. So, okay, so I, I, I really could consider here uh, the, the K infinity in terms of the of the action of, of the gromov hausdorff uh, convergence, okay? These are elements that are triggered. But we consider automorphism because we consider automorphism. There's no, there are no kernels for these maps, uh, algebraically. But there will be element that act trivially on the on the tree at infinity, and uh, therefore this group in general is a, is a is a quotient of H, and usually it will be a proper quotient. Okay, so the definition here varies. Uh, it's important. All right. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm going much lower than I thought, but okay. Um, so I'll explain the principles, maybe. Okay, so um, so so again, I'm just repeating here the the the, the setup. Uh, X is a is a product space. Um, H. Okay, we pass to we start with G, but but we, we pass to this finite index characteristic subgroup. So it's characteristic. So the automorphism of the B group act on this H as well because it, it's characteristic. Um, so so the, the group H act on this space. And uh, the advantage of H that uh, it preserves setwise each of the factor spaces, and we have we have the sequence of automorphisms that uh, we twist the action using this um, using this this automorphism, and we get a, we get a limit action on a real tree, okay? And uh, for, for this for this sequence, we get a corresponding corresponding limit group, which is H modulo the kernel. Now, if if the Yes. Okay. Um, now, oh, I should say maybe I, I thought it even appeared before, but but anyway, um, this this was very convenient for me. Uh, there is a paper by Daniel Groves and M Michael Hall on um, on um, okay. They, they they deal with um, with equation in Noetherian families of of asymmetrically hyperbolic groups. Anyway, they they they, um, they do all the technical um, setup is needed here and. Uh, I can always I can I can refer to them. I don't need the, the analysis of equation theory and so on, but but uh, but they are they all all that is needed in order to to analyze uh, this this limit action was done by them. Um, okay, so so from from the action of L on it's action of H, but but this K infinity acts trivially, so so it's really a faithful action of L. It's possible to write to, to read off splittings of the splittings of the group. Okay, it doesn't have to be like this, but it could be surfaces, etc. Could be splitting it over finite groups, free groups, etc. Free splittings, etc. Uh, and each time we, we do that, we get a map to uh, from H to a limit group, which has a splitting. The big problem here, okay, that doesn't appear in the original construction of the JSJ, is that these limit groups are different. Okay, the, the groups are different, the kernels are different. You have them uh, also correspond to each of these factors. And um, you know, the whole machine that, that was used to, to construct the, the, the JFJ, and it doesn't really matter what, what machine you use. Um, I mean, all, all the construction of the JFJ, the machine will fail because, because it has a kernel. There, there's, another, um, there's another conceptual big problem here. Uh, and this is, you see, we look at quotients here and, and splitting off quotients. Now, the big advantage of the JSJ is that, that the automorphism of the group can be read from a, at one level, from a splitting of the group, okay? It's, 
almost an ideal situation. Here, when you when you look at uh, when you look at at, um, at splittings that are obtained from quotients in general, there's no there's no chance that something like this will be true. Even if you consider only free splittings, okay, all, not these splittings, but only free splittings, it, it, there is no something similar to the JSJ that will that will uh, somehow describe all the free splittings of quotients of a given finitely presented group. Actually, I have a work on that with, with Eric Jaligo. And we constructed the mccann rosborough diagram that encode all the free splittings of quotients of a finitely presented group. This was needed afterwards for logic purposes. But, but there is no chance that it will be in one level. Okay, there, there could be, there is a mccann rosborough diagram, actually not canonical, but, the, but it cannot appear in one level. And it took me quite a long time to decide whether if one tries to develop a theory here, whether it should be in one level or it, it should be something like mccann rosborough diagram. And you know, Macanus Borough diagram in this setup is I'll explain that is much easier to construct, but but it's much less powerful. Okay, so uh, what we want is something that will remind, will be you know somehow connected to the JSJ in that case of a hyperbolic group. All right. So uh, so okay, so how to match the different projections and uh, you know it. I knew how to construct some sort of mccann borough diagram because these, these are tools that existed from before. As I said, in Grobs and Hall, they also constructed, they don't construct actually uh, mccann borough diagram, I think. But anyway, they, 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 they prepare all the tools to construct. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe they do, but, but uh, I think not. Um, but they prepare all the tools that are needed for that. Um, as I said, it, it's, it's, it's much, in a sense, it's much weaker. But uh, but this is something that one could start with, and, and I said I, I was really puzzled whether to to look for some sort of JSJ or to look for mccann borough diagram. And at the end, I decided, you know, if I if I cannot beat this this uh, this this um, mccann borough diagram, I better join it. So uh, it means that we first construct a mccann borough diagram, and then we use this to construct a, a JSJ. Um, so so let me. Yeah, I don't know how much I managed to say. Somehow, I, I, this is the first time that I talk about it, and I, I somehow assume that I'll be able to say much more. Um, okay, so um, so how to construct this uh, this mccann borough diagram? Um, so we, we said we, we start with uh, with automorphism pi. I, I work now with each projection separately. By the way, I have an hour, or I have less than that. Um, about fifty-five minutes. So you okay. still have. 10 minutes or so. Ten minutes. All right, all right, I'll, I'll get wherever I get. Um, so um, so, so th there's a sequence of automorphisms. In the beginning, we, we construct one limit group. Now this limit group will have, will, as I said, will, will have splitting, if it's divergent, it will have a splitting. So we can we can associate modular groups with that. Yeah. Now, from now on, we don't study automorphisms anymore. It comes from automorphism, but we study quasimorphisms. And um, or if you want, if, if it was a real kernel, we study homomorphisms of this limit group, which are in general quotients or proper quotients of the original one. And we can construct a, we can construct a diagram. The, the diagram here, but but we are interested only in splittings that are obtained originally from automorphism because this is what we want to study. We are not interested in the algebraic structure of this limit group. We are just interested in automorphisms. So we cannot use the JSJ of, of these limit groups, although the JSJ exists. But we, we, we use only splitting that come from these automorphisms. And because of that, some of these epimorphisms will be actually isomorphisms. But it's guaranteed that after finitely many steps, in fact, after boundedly many steps, we, we will uh, move to, to a proper quotient. And this is this, this descending chain conditions uh, was proved by Grobs and Hall that after, after um, uh, such, such a sequence terminate after finite time, and when it terminates, we get we get a quasi sequence of a quasi morphism obtained from this automorphism, which is non-divergent anymore. So there is a bound on that. This is important. Um, and uh, okay, the, the whole things here are only finitely generated. It's not finitely presented in general, and finite generated is too big for us in terms of cardinality. So we can replace each such resolution by finitely presented object. Just, just for you know, to, to 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 think about it. Just think that we replace each of these limit group with a finitely presented object. This is not how it's done, but, but never mind. And therefore, there are only countably many of them. If you replace the whole 
this resolution, we call it. If you replace it by finitely presented object, it, it is, there are only finitely, there are only countably many of them. And this is, as I said, there is, and at the end, there is a bound on the, on the stretching factor. We can assume this bound is a positive integer. So we can, assume, we can, we can count all these, uh, all these finitely presented approximations of, of such things. And using, okay, I think by now pretty standard compactness argument, uh, it's possible to, uh, to be left with only finitely many of them. So, um, so, so it's enough to, to use only finitely many of these resolutions. And what we get is what I call a higher rank mechanium rosborough diagram for products. So what does it mean? We have M factors, okay, M factor spaces. Um, so each, each um, resolution, each element in our diagram will, will, uh, will have finite, finitely many uh, resolution for each factors because we, we start with sequence of automorphism and we look what happened in each of the factors. But you see, when we analyze them, that's the disadvantage here. When, when we analyze them, we analyze them separately. We move to quasimorphisms and these quasimorphisms are just appropriate, just for the, just for the appropriate factor. There's no, when we continue in this diagram from the first level, we lose, to, there's, there's no coordination between the factors anymore. So, so we, have, we have this M collection of, of covers and finitely many of them are enough. That means that every automorphism of the group will factor through one of these, uh, one of these finitely many M collections. Okay, this is the, this is the high rank mechanical work diagram. It was obtained from, by, by compactness okay. argument. So there's no chance that any, like, anything like this will be uh, canonical. Okay, here is, um, here is uh, what, what I call the completion of a resolution. I, I'm not going to get into that. Actually, I should say, I don't know how much I'll get to that, but, but what, what, one thing that, um, that is appealing for me, and actually it appeared before in a, in a work with, with Koji Fujiwara, that, um, that um, tools and techniques that I developed to study uh, the first order, the first order the theory of free group actually appear here, the tools, not, not, uh, not, not, not anything from logic. And this is, I think this, this should happen more and more. I mean, there are techniques there, in the solution of the Tarski problem in, in generalization that, that should have application in group theory and in, 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 uh, in other places. And this is an example. You see, studying automorphisms of groups in the beginning doesn't seem to be related, but apparently the tools are related, are useful, not just related. Okay, so, um, so the first, maybe I'll, I'll just describe that. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that um, you know, at first that, uh, that each, each of these resolution has only one level. You see, if, if, if it has one level, meaning just one map, if there were no maps, then there are bounds of the stretching factors, okay? And if there are bounds of the stretching factors and the, the group acts uh, properly and co-compactly, co-compactly does not matter, just act properly, then it means that only uh, finitely many automorphism will factors or something like this. So this is not very interesting. So I assume that uh, there are, there's at most one, so every resolution has um, has at most two floors, or two levels. Okay, so this is this is the first the first thing, and in this case, okay, there's um, the, the group of automorphisms form. Okay, what what I call uh, in the work of the problem is, is a test sequence. It's not really a test sequence; it's a weak test sequence. And in, in, uh, what it really means is that uh, this sequence of automorphisms just converge to to the splitting that we see here. One, one needs to explain what converge mean because we are going to see it in different scales, like in our, our entry or something. But, but anyway, from this, from this sequence of automorphism, we can read off, uh, we can read off these splittings, all the M splittings on all factors. And now one can, one can define a, a complexity of these resolutions. Okay, complexity of resolution is a, is a, is a major issue in, 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 in studying uh, the first order theory of um, of, uh, of a free group, but in there it's far far more complicated. Um, here it is, it's, it's rather simple. We just define, say, naive uh, complexity of, of these abelian splittings. Okay, first the the core strength, the number of free factors and free elements. Then the, the topology. These are orbifolds in general. They're not they're not just surfaces. Um, so so the the these orbifolds say the order characteristic, the genus order psychographically in, in, in decreasing order. And then, then things to do with the, with the abelian groups and the edges. Uh, and we consider only, only the resolution. This is maximal complexity are well ordered. Uh, the complexity, sorry, is, is well ordered. So we, we, can, we can look only at maximal complexity. 
And we, we, we look at this, this weak test sequences, these test sequences that converge into maximal complexity resolution. Now, if we take any automorphism, any automorphism uh, in, in, in the group and we compose it, pre-compose the, the sequence with, with this automorphism, we get another test sequence. Just as, okay, maybe it doesn't factor to this resolution, but we have universality of the of this uh, of the diagram that we had before. So it will, if it doesn't factor to this one, at least a subsequence of that will factor through another one. Okay, again, because because of universality, and using that, it's possible to prove. Okay, this is I think this will be my. I have more slides, but I will I will stop here because of time. That um, that um, for single for single level uh, level resolution, there is exist just one M, M collection of cover resolution that is preserved by a finite index subgroup of the automorphism. Okay, so, so there is this, you see, M, M splittings, but it's important to know, these are not splittings of the original group. These are splittings of quotients. And usually it will be splittings of proper quotients of the groups. The, the, the quotient itself is not canonical, but the form of the decomposition is, is, is canonical. I didn't study much the, the canonicality of this decomposition, but, but anyway, all surfaces that should appear, et cetera, um, of course, it all depends on the finite index subgroup that we chose. Because if we choose if we choose another finite index, then you know we, we get the splitting, which will be in some sense commensurable with this one, but it will be different. Um, and and this this decomposition will encode okay not all automorphism but the finite set, a finite index subgroup of the automorphisms. I will I will not talk about resolutions with higher level now, but let me just let me just pass to my last slide. Oh, this is right angle. Oh, not a lot less than. Okay, in general, from this uh, from this decomposition, okay, I, I jumped uh, several slides, but um, from this decomposition, it, now it, it's possible to say all sorts of things on the on the outer automorphism group. So, for example, okay, if, if the group, if if all splittings are of one ended, let's say one ended splitting, it's not important if the group is one ended, but it's important whether these splittings don't contain um, free decompositions or, or splittings over finite uh, over finite groups, then we get also a map from the from the um, uh, from this finite index subgroup of, of the outer automorphism group uh, onto mapping class group. Sorry, not onto. That's important. Into the mapping class group of these surfaces and outer outer automorphism group of some virtually uh, virtually abelian um, vertex groups as well. So it's not the general linear group, but an outer automorphism group of finitely generated virtually abelian groups, and the kernel, the kernel has to be uh, has to be finitely generated virtually abelian. Okay, it's a it's a similar picture in a sense to what happened um, in in um, in hyperbolic groups, or actually it's also similar to what uh, what Charney and Botman did for uh, for right and and Gnosian groups, just that there there are no surfaces at all. Um, okay, now if the group is not one-ended, then um, then you have to work. Then the outcome cannot be stated uh, so so nicely in this well so in such a short way because we will also get the map into into these objects, but then there will be a kernel to the map, and the kernel to the map. You know, after we look in the kernel, we can, we can run off the construction of this high ring JHJ decomposition just for the kernel because. You know, we, we didn't really need to tell the, this, this machine that these, these were all automorphisms. It, it's okay to take it just from a subgroup. And it may be that new surfaces and new abelian groups will emerge. From, from the free decomposition, it may be that new of them will emerge. So we get another map with another kernel. This can happen boundedly many times. And at the end, what we will get, let me see if I have a slide here. Yeah. At the end, what we will get is, uh, you know, we'll get factors with only um, virtually Okay, I, I didn't consider. We'd only virtually cyclic, yeah, virtually cyclic decomposition and maybe some free elements. I didn't uh, draw here also edges with with free with sorry with finite uh, edge groups. And if you like, if if you consider only stabilizer of the factors, if there are no free decomposition, only stabilizers. Yes, then um, of all the factors, in in all the factors also in the in the um, um, in the space. Okay, because the, the space was a product of certain factors. Uh, it will be um, a, the stabilizer will be finally generated uh, virtually abelian. Okay, I, I will not talk about the generalization to to uh, hierarchy hyperbolic group, but this is anyway. This is not the main the main thing. I really think that the main thing is about products. 
I didn't manage also to talk about um, about uh, resolutions with more floors, but okay. I mean, there, there's a limit. What one can do, or I didn't pro I didn't plan it properly. Okay, <laughs> I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Are there questions either online or at ESHS? Yes. Uh, so you 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 mentioned uh, quasi-morphisms uh, occurring uh, somewhere in your in your uh, in your resolutions. Uh, what, what are right. those quasi-morphisms? What, what, what are they? Huh? I mean, could you what? could you say more about those quasi-morphisms? Oh yes. Uh, okay. So let me see where. Yes, because. Uh, okay. You see the the. the Okay, let me let me just say that um, the, the limit group here. Okay, the limit group here is um, is the group H modulo modulo this kernel. Now this kernel in general it doesn't act trivially on the it doesn't act trivially on the on the space, but but it will uh, but what 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 it will happen? It's this kernel. Uh, okay, no, not sorry, not, not not this kernel contains more element, but but anyway. There will be elements that move any point, just um, move any point in the space or in the factor, just a bounded amount. So, okay, think think about, for example, think about the limit group here that um, that um, which is finitely presented. So it has finitely finitely many relations. So these relations are not mapped to the identity, but they are mapped to element that move any point in the space by. Uh, by this bounded demand, and this is a normal subgroup. Okay, that, that's what that's what quasi-morphisms here means. It's actually not very far from from homomorphism. Just one needs to to get used to work with this thing. But but the quasi-morphism, we're not interested in all quasi-morphism. We are interested only in quasi-morphism that are somehow obtained from automorphisms of the B group through these resolutions. Okay, but uh, again, it's not that far from. Dealing with them using this this Makanin-Mosborov diagram machine is not very different than dealing with homomorphisms. But again, it's important that we are dealing only from those that come from automorphism of the ambient group and not 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 just general quasimorphisms. At the beginning, you mentioned uh, Mikhailov Mikhailova groups. Um, you have example of Mikhailo interesting Mikhailo Mikhailova groups with uh, a lot of automorphisms. I didn't. I didn't study. Yeah, yeah. I didn't you study didn't subgroups. I didn't study subgroups. Okay. For this, it's Mikhailova important. group acts on the product of three. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I assume that the action is co-compact. Ah, okay. Yeah, also in hyperbolic other... group. group, right? The JSJ will not give all automorphisms of, of all subgroups. Even the JSJ of the subgroup will not will often call all automorphisms. Are there other questions? Well, if not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>